Good evening, everyone. We are continuing Judges, the book of Judges, the period. And we are going on to this thing called Portraits of Decay, where in the last five chapters of Judges, from chapters 17 to 21, we see portraits of decay in the life of Israel that led to the need for God to, to raise judges. We have been reading about the judges in the earlier chapters but uh, and what they have been doing, but here we actually see what caused the need for judges. So this section comprises four episodes for us to understand Israel's internal religious, so that's about God, the social and the community condition of decay. And it is also spiritually what happens to the Christian community when God's people fail to faithfully teach and transmit obedience to each new generation. And the new generation are left to their own form of worship. So basically, it's to say that uh, uh, each new generation that comes along, they are not being taught properly. They just carry on worshipping any way they like. And so we go on to Judges chapter 17. And we find that in this case, it is a family's apostasy. And this is the story of Micah, or some people may pr pronounce as Micah. And Micah came from the hill country of Ephraim, and he stole 1,100 shekels of silver from his mother. And she uttered a curse, which he heard. He heard the curse. So he told her that he took her silver. You see, words like he took the silver rather than he stole. Yeah? She said, the Lord bless you. Now, he stole and the mother can say, the Lord bless you. And then when he returned the silver, she took 200 shekels out and had a silversmith make a carved image and a cast idol and put them in Mika's house. Now, what we're going to see in this story of the family's apostasy is about Micah's story, which takes place not long after Joshua's death. Joshua died not too long ago, and this already happened, the apostasy of the Israelites. And he's going to employ a Levite in this story. And this Levite uh, he employs as his priest is actually the grandson of Moses. And that name of the grandson is Jonathan. So we are saying not long after Joshua's death. And yeah, Moses, grandson Joshua, uh, sorry, Jonathan is not long after, uh, not long in coming after, after uh, the story of Joshua. The next thing we find is that de the Danites have not yet come into their inheritance among the tribes of Israel. They meant did not manage to possess their land yet. And then we have a, another person, Phinehas, son of Eleazar. And that means uh, basically Aaron's grandson is still alive at the Battle of Gibeah in Judges chapter 20. Uh, fin Phinehas was actually alive uh, during the, the Exodus journey, right? So uh, he was still alive at this period of time. Judges 20, which is to say that uh, this story is actually very recent after Joshua's death. And we find that historian, his, uh, Jewish historian Josephus places the four stories in these last chapters of Judges after the death of Joshua and the elders, and even before the first judge of Israel, Othniel. And that connects them with Judges chapter 2, verse 10. What is Judges 2 verse 10? Let's read that to remind ourselves.
Can somebody help us read Judges 2.10? Okay, Judges 2 verse 10. After the whole generation has been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Thank you, Mac. Okay, so we see that after that whole generation refers to Joshua. Joshua and the elders. So when they died, another generation grew up that knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. So the, the generation that is left behind after Joshua died, this is the generation. And so Micah's story is an example of the ignorance of God's people shortly after Joshua's death. In fact, just the next generation only. And that shows how without a centralized government, and effective spiritual leadership. Just one typical family in Israel strays from their worship and knowledge of God. So we see this story, Micah steals from the mother, and then the mother pronounces a curse, and then after that she reverses it to a godly blessing, when she discovers, oh, my son is the one that stole. Let's take a look at James 3, verses 9 to 12 to see what the Bible has to say about that kind of behavior. James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. With a thong we praise our Lord and Father, and with it curse human beings will be made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from them? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Thanks, Jack. All right, so in this reference here, we see that... Uh, James is talking about from the mouth, we cannot be talking blessing and cursing at the same time. Yeah, so here, my, Mika's mother, she can pronounce a curse and then when she hears that it is a son who stole, she started to bless instead. So we see here that as a mother, she did not rebuke. She did not rebuke or correct the son. For committing a wrong. And then what's more, she invokes the covenant God's name to bless instead of disciplining him. Yeah, so she used God's name. Yeah, she used God's name to bless him instead of disciplining him for stealing. Now, this story, very short appearance of the mother, there seems to be no sign of the father, whether the father is an absentee father or dead father. Yeah, but so it's between just Mika and the mother in the story. And she talks about God, but does not obey him. So you can imagine this is very telling Mika's upbringing and her attitude and philosophy towards God's covenant commandment, no stealing. Uh, one of the Ten Commandments you may remember is uh, thou shall not steal in and we can find it in Deuteronomy 5, verse 19. And she's probably like modern parents, you know. They are sensitive about the child's feelings and self-esteem, and they will not correct or discipline them for wrong. Oh, cannot, cannot scold them, cannot discipline them. Otherwise, they will be very fragile and their self-esteem will be damaged. So such morality shows how God's word fails to be a standard of right or wrong and discipline. No need because the child is very fragile. Then so we see that the elder generation fails to keep the holy identity and distinctiveness of God and his law to train the next generation. And therefore, this next generation will carry such an attitude to bring up their next generation without regard for God. Yeah, because it's okay to lie, it's okay to curse and then bless, 
and it's okay to ignore stealing. Yeah, all these things, just close an eye, it's not important. Then, next thing she does is she takes part of the silver to make into two idols to put in Mika's house. See, she made a carved image and a cast idol. And this violates the first two commandments. Ten commandments violates the first two. No other gods and no idols. That can be found in Deuteronomy 5, 7, and 8. Yeah, so just in this very first section of this chapter 17 alone, we can see something already terribly wrong about the family. Then Mika. Mika had a shrine. A shrine is a little bit like a personal, small, small temple. Okay, a small temple. He made an ephod and some idols and installed one of his sons as his priest. And the Bible tells us once again, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. So we discover that Micah himself was his father. Yeah? He installed one of his sons as his priest. So it becomes a family business. And you can see that the mother gave him two idols, put in Mika's house, and then Mika himself had some idols. So in other words, his personal shrine at home is something like a house temple. You may recall uh, Gideon's house. Yeah, it's also like a house temple because all the men of the town come to his house to worship that Baal. Yeah, the, the idol Baal. And so for Mika, in his case, he actually has quite a few idols in his house. And this regards the command that God is to be worshipped only at the place where he puts his name there for his dwelling. In Deuteronomy 12 verses 4 and 5, God says they are only to go to one specified place that he will decide. And later on, he decides it is Jerusalem. And they are supposed to go to, basically, for these people, it will be the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. Yeah, they are supposed to go to the tabernacle. But they are all worshipping at home. So the Israelites are not gathering at the tabernacle to worship God. And they stay at home for their own worship. And worse that besides that, you see that Micah installs his son as his priest. But God's priest is to come only from the Levite tribe. So this potentially shows us once again, they worship as they like. Yeah, so you see, in those days, everyone did as he saw fit. They worship as they like. And notice how many of God's covenant commands this Three generation family has broken. So many commandments. The mother and Mika, right? They have broken lots of commandments of God. And so it shows that Israel needs a king to lead the individuals and families. And it's very much like Christians today, you know, who wish to worship God independently on their own. Just like what we see happening with Mika. Right And uh, Gideon, when we saw the story of Gideon, all these people, they have their own worship at their own places. They worship independently and they don't wish to worship centrally with fellow Christians, but at home by themselves, just like Micah here. So this is the situation with the people of Israel. And no wonder, because they are leaderless, they don't have a Moses or a Joshua to lead them. And there's no king, and everyone is doing as he decides for himself. Everyone is their own judge for what to do. There's no common leader for everybody, and no spiritual leadership in particular. So it's not too surprising then that the people of Israel, they pick up the worship idols of gods and the practices of the people of the land. And similarly, we have Christians who choose to practice their faith at home without spiritual leadership in the church of God. And they decide for themselves what they will do 
for their own brand of Christian worship and living. They, are, they make up their own, their own laws just uh, instead of following God's covenant closely. So they are just like Mika and his mother and so on, making up their own laws that it's okay to worship at home or anything else they decide. Then, story continues with this young Levite. Uh, so Levites are supposed to be the people that help with the worship. So at first, Micah installed the son, which is not a, it is not a Levite, and now a Levite comes along. So this Levite from Bethlehem in Judah went in search of a place to stay. And Micah invited him to live with him and be his father and priest for 10 shekels of silver a year, clothes and food. So he's earning a salary. The Levite agreed, okay, we have a we have a contract. And Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. So from here, he actually knows this Levite has become my priest that it should be a Levite, that is, priest. But he went to choose his son earlier on. So he knew it was wrong, but he carried on doing it so that he can have a priest. And now, just because a Levite comes, he said, okay, this one will now be my priest because he's from the Levite tribe. So we will see in this part here the ignorance of white right worship is seen with the entry of the young Levite into Micah's family life. Okay, the, you see that the Levite is so-called out of a job in Israel's worship. He's looking for a place to minister. Now, Levites are ministers for the people, not for a private individual or a family. Okay, let's take a look at... Uh, Deuteronomy 18 for these two references. Deuteronomy 18, 6 to 8, and uh, 6, 18, verse 1. Deuteronomy, uh, what is that? 18, 18 uh, 6 to 8. I myself have selected your, your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you, dedicated to the Lord to do the work at the tent of the meeting. But only you and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I'm giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary is to be put to death. Then go back to 1A, right? Deuteronomy 18. Yeah, eighteen one. The Lord said to Aaron, You, your sons and family, are to bear the responsibility for offences connected with the sanctuary, and you and your sons alone are to bear the responsibility for offences connected with the priesthood. Oh, uh, are we on the right book? Yeah. Deuteronomy 18. Oh, Numbers, sorry. You were reading from Numbers. Also happened to be also about the priest. <laughs> okay. Deuteronomy 18. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, let's look at Deuteronomy 18, 6 to Verse. 8. No, the one just now I read already, right? Eh? No? Different, right? You are looking at... Uh, numbers. Numbers, yeah. Okay, 6 to 8. If a Levite moves to one of your towns, anywhere in Israel where he's living, and comes in all earth... What is that? Earnest, earnestness to the place the Lord will choose. choose. He may minister in the name of the Lord his God like all his fellow Levites who serve there in the presence of the Lord. He is to share equally in their benefits, even though receive money from the seal of family possessions. Uh, verse 1. 1. 
the Levitical priests, indeed the whole tribe of Levi, are to have no allotment or inheritance with Israel. They shall live on the food offerings, for that is their inheritance. They shall live on the offerings made to the Lord by fire, for that is their inheritance. Okay, so basically what we find is that the Levites, they are supposed to minister in the name of the Lord at the place where God is supposed to be, the place the Lord will choose. Verse 6, huh? chapter 18, verse 6, supposed to minister at the place the Lord will choose. So what happens here is this Levite ministers in Micah's house. That is an individual or a family. So he is actually not doing the right thing either. Okay. And then we actually see that the all the priests were Levites, but the tribe of Le, uh, from the tribe of Levi. But it doesn't mean that all Levites were appointed priests. Okay. So that means to say that uh, the Levite tribe is the the big big circle and the uh, the priest is the subset inside the circle. Okay, the priests are only a small group of Levites. And the priests are basically descendants of Aaron and his sons. And Levites are to serve God by assisting the priests to perform other duties at the tabernacle for the community. And that is New Numbers 18, verse 21 to 23. So we see that Micah makes the Levite, in this case, Moses' descendant, his personal family priest. So this whole system of worship, making this Levite the priest, is actually wrong, not obeying God. Yeah, and the problem is the Levite is out of a job. Because you see, everywhere people are making their own worship at home. Yeah, they're making their own worship at home. See, they... The mother put the idols in Micah's house. Micah also has a shrine. So the Levite that is supposed to help in the proper worship at the tabernacle is out of a job. And that's why this guy is looking around for a place to stay and earn his living. So this coming together of Micah and the Levite is typically it's quite likely a typical picture of the apostasy of Israel. Apostasy means they are straying from God. They are not following God's orders. The people stop worshipping. Okay. Or they corrupt how God is to be worshipped. And then everyone is doing as he sees fit. Without a national worship structure according to the way that God has actually set up, okay? They don't have the national worship structure to support the ministry of the Levites. So the Levites are forced to leave their homes to go and look for survival employment. And it is families like Micah who find their own Levite or spiritual minister and pay them to be their family priest. And so both parties meet each other's need but they violate their covenant with God. You can see, people are wrong, Levites also are wrong, all doing wrong things. And so Christians, picture of Christians can be just like pagans, treating religion, treating God as the means to gain their personal ends. Yeah, they adapt beliefs and practices of other faiths into Christian life. So that's what both the Levite here as well as a Mika are doing. And without effective leadership and discipline or correction, they make the Christian faith out to fit their desires and thinking and their own needs. Lah. Yeah, like you see, the two parties, they are meeting each other's need, but not necessarily meeting God's covenant commands. Yeah, so instead of knowing God and letting God mold them or mold us as Christians, we worshippers mold Christian truth to accommodate ourselves. And having molded worship to his comfort level by having a priest, Micah is satisfied and convinced that God will bless and prosper him. Yeah, he says, now I know the Lord will be good to me 
since this Levite has become my priest. And so he's violating God's command still. Yeah, instead of his son, he's choosing a Levite, but still not correct. And he still thinks God will bless him. And that's the same with the faith of Christians that can easily turn out to be man-made and man-controlled. They do things that violate God's instructions in the Bible, but they can say, oh, I do it for God, or I do it to worship God. And then they expect, see, now I know, now I know, they expect, yeah, God will bless them and what they do. Very much like what we just did on Sunday yesterday, right, in the Bible study, this thing about Ab uh, Cain, yes. So once again, this is a situation that is similar to Cain, the kind of worship that is not authentic, the kind of worship that does not fulfill what God wants. When Christians do not learn the right ways and theology or truth of God to understand and follow how God is to be worshipped, they end up with all kinds of beliefs and practices that they may come up on their own. You know, uh, for example, like Cain, he expects God to bless him and accept him, even though he brings the wrong offering. So very much similar to Micah, the Lord will be good to me because this Levite has become my priest, mix up his own worship. Yes. So they syncreti syncretize, that means they kind of like combine, combine practices of worshipping God with the practices of worshipping idols. They combine those to form their own form of Christianity, whether they meet their own self-perceived spiritual needs, uh, because they meet their own self-spiritual needs in their own way. And so everybody does as he or she sees fit, and they don't really know or follow God's laws accurately, or God's worship, or God's ways for them. Still, they believe God will bless them. And this is the spiritual state of God's people. So with this chapter, we can see, right, as a, as a typical picture of the families in Israel, yeah, Micah and his mother, they are just one example of how family in society is corrupting God's worship causing true worship to collapse and compromise the holy identity of Israel. Yeah, so they are very far away from the good example of Abel, but they are more like the example of Cain, the, dem the negative demonstration of Cain in their worship. So you can see how our uh, story all the way from Cain and Abel now becomes relevant to compare and understand what is happening here in this part of the Bible, right? Because we see that the, where God is concerned is he's the same God and his, uh, his commands and his standards are consistent throughout. Okay, so we finished chapter 17. We saw a family's apostasy. We go to chapter 18 and we continue to see a Levite as well as a cleansed apostasy. Okay, we have seen one Levite already uh, in the form of Jonathan, uh, Moses' grandson. Now we see another Levite and we see a clan involved. And the story again starts with, in those days, Israel had no king. So our story focus moves to the Danite tribe now. So a tribe is involved and the Levite who serves as Micah's priest. Okay, so the Danites are unscrupulous in the way they come into an inheritance. And the Levite is tempted and persuaded to be promoted to be the spiritual leader of a whole clan instead of just one family. So there's a personal kind of motivation because, oh, now I'm more important because I'm not just the priest of a family. I'm going to be the priest of a whole clan. Yes. So that's what we're going to see in this chapter, right? And this statement, in those days, Israel had no king, 
anticipates once again that Israel needs a king, somebody to rule and lead the clans so that the king can unite the clans. Okay? Rule and lead the clans to unite them. So we have the the Danites have not yet come into their inheritance and they sent five of the men to explore the land. And they came to Mika's house where they spent the night and they recognized the young Levite. He helped them inquire of God, so ask God, and told them their journey had the Lord's approval. Okay, so we see that unlike the other tribes, the Danites have not been able to take possession of the land allotted to them. We see that in Joshua 19 verses 40 to 48. And so they send scouts to explore the land. The scouts are given hospitality by Micah and they find the young Levite whom they must have met when he was looking for a place to stay. And the Levite updates them on his employment with Micah and then uses the effort to inquire if their journey will be successful. Well, what happens after they were told that their journey had the Lord's approval? They left and they came to Laish. And the people living there in, were in safety, unsuspecting, secure and prosperous. And the five men returned to their brothers, but returned back to the clan of Dan and told them of the spacious land that lacked nothing whatever. So this is a very good place to settle in. So the scouts, after they left uh, Mika's house, they continue on their mission and they find Laish to be an ideal place to attack and to settle in. And for them, they take this as God's answer of success because the Levite told them, oh, God's approval. So they take this as the answer of success to find a perfect place to settle in and report back to camp with their discovery. Then what happened was they returned to Mika's house with 600 men armed for battle. And they stole the carved image, the ephod, and you see the other household gods and the cast idol. So Mika's house was like a temple with many gods there, down there. And so the Levite that became the priest, when the priest asked what they were doing, they told him to serve their tribe rather than just one man's household as family and priest. And so the priest gladly joined them because it's a promotion. He is going to be more important to, to a whole clan of people. So the Danite men, they return to Mika's house and they steal all his idols. And the Levite who is now installed as Mika's priest tries to stop them. But they offer him a, an offer that he cannot refuse. Yeah, they give him an offer that he cannot refuse. And he's tempted because he can play a bigger and more important role as the priest of a whole tribe instead of just one miserly household. And he grabs this better job offer. He joins the Danites and he dishonors his agreement with Mika to work for him and he leaves Mika without telling Mika anything. Okay, so later on, Mika finds out something wrong. So he and some men that he gathers, uh, who lived near him, they chased the Danites. But the Danites said, don't argue with us, or some hot-tempered men will attack you, and you and your family will lose your lives. And Mika saw that they were too strong for him, so he had to give up and return home. So when Mika finds out that he has been robbed, he is unable to retrieve. He can't take back his stolen god, gods and the priest. Because the Danites overwhelm him by numbers. And what's more, they threaten his life. Threaten his life if he even argues with them. Yeah, don't argue with us or some hot-tempered men will attack you. 
So he cannot even argue, and they show that there are violent people among them. The Danite tribe have got violent people who will commit murder if Mika insists on recovering his property. You see how daring they are? Already they steal, and then they dare to say, you want to, you want to argue with us? We are going to kill you. So they are very violent. They exhibit the same character traits as the Philistines back in chapter 14, verse 15 and 15, verse 6. If you remember, that was the story of Samson. Yeah, they were very violent. They, the Philistines, they burned up Samson's wife and the father-in-law Yeah, and, and other violent acts. So God's people display the same ungodly character and behavior as the pagan people. And Christians have anger management issues or Christians may take advantage of kind people in their good nature. So that is somewhat the equivalent with what the Danites are like like, as God's people. Christians can have these uh, ungodly character and behavior displays as well. Now, Mika has no choice but to let them carry away his idols and his priests. His idols are gods that cannot help him against human robbers and a cheating priest. Okay, so with that, the Danites went on to Laish, and now the Bible says they are peaceful and unsuspecting people again. The Bible repeats this thing about them. And so the Danites attacked with a sword and burned down the city. And then they rebuilt the city and settled there. And they named it Dan after their forefather Dan, although the city used to be called Laish. So they get rid of all signs that it was actually um, called Laish. Now, what this means for us is the author of Judges shows disapproval of the Danites killing this peaceful and unsuspecting people so that they can take over the land. Now, apparently, by calling the Bible, uh, by calling these people a peaceful and unsuspecting people, it shows that the people of Laish are not targeted by God to be killed. Okay, that is to say, if you remember, when God brought the Israelites into this land, God had got them to kill or kick out people, if you remember, right? Okay. They, they had to kill a lot of people. Now, those people, we did read a verse here, a, a, a verse there or a phrase there that shows us that they were wicked people and their sin, as God told Abraham back in Genesis, that their sin has reached full measure. So when God told his people to kill those people, they, he was, they, they were actually executing God's judgment on those people. But here in this case, the people of Laish are peaceful and unsuspecting. So they are not meant to be killed. But the Danites went to kill them and take over their city. And even if the Danites wanted to do that, they should have, they should have made an offer of peace to the city. Okay, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10 to 15, uh, when a city is far away or when a city is peaceful, not those that deserve God's punishment, right? The, the, the Israelites are supposed to offer peace, but instead they exhibit the violent nature of the world. Genesis chapter 6 verse 13 is a time of Noah when God saw that the world was full of violence and evil. Yeah, so they exhibit the violent nature of the worldly people instead of righteous and blameless behavior of God. Uh, so now we see God's people are the ones who are sinning. They are taking advantage of others who are vulnerable. They are peaceful and they are even more unsuspecting. They are vulnerable. Okay, so you can see how God's people... Uh, uh, but in particular, this clan of Dan, they are actually quite uh, 
far in their straying away from God. So they set up the idols for themselves. And then Jonathan, son of Gershon, the son of Moses. So this is where we get the information that the Levite is actually Moses' grandson. Yeah, Jonathan, the grandson of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan till the captivity of the land. That's a very long period of time. They continued to use the idols Micah had made all the time the house of God was at Shiloh. And that would be the story of Eli and Samuel. Yeah, All the time the house of God was at Shiloh, they still, this Danish tribe, tribe of Dan and uh, Jonathan and his descendants, right? They were still priests in an ungodly way. And so we see that the Danites, they set up their idol worship that lasts till the land is exiled into captivity. And as a tribe, they have broken their covenant with God that Joshua helped them renew at Shechem. Yeah, before Joshua uh, was ready to die, he, he helped them to renew their covenant with God. But they have broken the covenant. And wrong worship can go on for generations. As we see here, it's a very long time. Many generations worship wrongly without discovering it for themselves. They have lost their identity and mission as God's people. So this Levite Jonathan, uh, son of Moses, has also similarly lost uh, his sense of mission and identity with the Danites. And a very important lesson we learn is that there's no guarantee that a godly man used mightily by God, and in this case Moses, no guarantee that he will have a godly descendant walking in his footsteps. Right? So such children do not necessarily make good godly leaders. And each generation and individual have to make their own choice to know and obey or worship God correctly. So everybody has to make their own choice. It doesn't matter what family you come from. It doesn't matter if you're if your father or your grandfather is mightily used by God. Yeah. A later son or grandson or great-grandson might actually not be walking closely with God in a correct way. So we see the result of Israel having no king in those days. We have the worship of individuals like Micah with the family and the mother. That worship has gone astray. And then similarly, the worship of tribes like Dan. This worship also has gone astray. And then the worship ministry of Levites, like Moses' grandson, has also gone astray. And it is not surprising that Bible, Isaiah 53 says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Yeah, we're all just like sheep. Huh? We go all over the place astray and turn to our own ways. And the story of another Levite and the tribe of Benjamin is no better. That's what we're going to read next. Yeah, so we just saw one Levite and now we're going to see another Levite. We saw one clan and now we have the whole tribe. So Judges 17 and 19 show even their religious leadership, the Levites, has lost their sense of duty and purpose and they have gone astray. The people compromise their worship of God and the Levites lose their livelihood as a result because they are supposed to minister in the worship. So if they compromise their worship, then the Levites have no, no job, no work to do. So they lose their livelihood and they have to find alternative livelihood. And then we see, for example, one ends up as Mika's personal family priest and, and then got promoted later on. But then we have the next one coming up. The other one is concerned with his own affairs rather than the ministry to the tribes. And we see this one 
in chapter 19 also quite seriously bad, seriously astray. So Judges 19, you have a Levite's personal affair, okay, their own personal business. Uh, once again, you see in those days, Israel had no king. And once again, the Bible repeats this need of God's people for someone, a king, to lead them and keep them on track with God. And once again, we can expect people to do as they choose. And then it's important for us to reflect, are we like that? Are we doing as we choose also? Story, a Levite living in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. She was unfaithful to him. She went back to her father's house in Bethlehem. After four months, he went to persuade her to return. Her father kept him staying five days before he left with his concubine. And his servant suggested that they spend the night at the city of Jebus, which is the old name of Jerusalem. But he said, no, we're not going to spend the night there because the people there are not Israelites, not our own, my own people. And he wanted to go to Gibeah in Benjamin. And at that place, an old man welcomed him to spend the night in his house. Okay, I've, cut, I've short, shortened some of the details so you can read the Bible story for yourself, how the father tried to keep him one day after another. Okay, so what do we learn from here? The Levite experiences warmth of hospitality at his father-in-law's house. So that's something that is very important as a host. Yeah, must be very hospitable. And traveling home with his concubine and servant, he refuses to stay in Jebus. That's the old name for Jerusalem preferring to push on to the Israelite town of Gibeah. And then he expects the standard of hospitality from his fellow Israelites to be better than that of the pagans. right? And in fact, he's, uh, if he's strictly religious, he should not even be spending, the, spending his uh, night with a non-Jew, non non-Israelite. But at Gibeah, when he arrived there, at first no one offers him a place to spend the night. But finally, you have an old man coming and offering him hospitality at his home. Now, when we read the story, we just think, oh, okay, here is this Levite with a concubine and so on. But I checked the dictionary. A concubine is a woman where in polygamous societies, that means in societies where the men marry two or more wives. Okay, in a society where men marry two or more wives, the woman lives with the man but has a lower status than, that status than his wife or wives, which is to say that this is a complicated marital relationship of the Levite. Supposedly, if he has a concubine, then he has a wife, but we don't read of the wife in the story. And then we have this concubine who is considered a mistress. Okay, so it's a complicated thing because the Levite is not supposed to have more than one wife. So I guess one wife and the concubine, that's not, not more than one wife. Yeah, okay. So you can see it's not, it's not fitting what God has told them to do. Levite, the priest, should only marry one wife. So as a Levite or as an Israelite, this man, he expects his own people to be more honorable than non-Israelites. And possibly he also remembers that as an Israelite, he cannot mix with Gentiles to spend the night with them. Now we cannot tell if he has a sense of superiority over the Gentiles or, or he's just obeying God's law. But whatever attitude he's guided by, he experiences a rude shock when it comes to the tribe of Benjamin at Gibeah. So what happens to, for him to get a shock is while they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city pounded on, uh, I think I, 
pounded on the door. Yeah, sorry, not pounded on the city. Shouting for the old man to bring the man out, to bring the Levite out, so they could have sex with him. I don't know whether this sounds familiar to you. We have actually read something similar like this before. Anybody remembers how why this sounds so familiar? The story of Lot, is it? <clears throat> yes, the story of Lot. That's right. Story of yeah. Lot at Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. yeah. So it's something like a repeat of that story. The men of the town, they turn up and they demand that the old man surrender him for homosexual rape. Now, we don't expect such blatant, ungodly behavior from our own people. See, this situation is similar to Lot's experience in Sodom in Genesis chapter 19. You can read those four verse, five verses, 19 verse 4 to 8, you will see something similar to this. Ironically, these offenders are not pagans. They are God's people. Can you see how terrible it is? In Sodom and Gomorrah, those are pagan people. But here in Gibeah, right, it is the Benjamites tribe, the people of God. Their values and behavior are as wicked and as vile as the pagan Sodomites that God judged and destroyed. God's people are becoming people who deserve judgment and destruction just like the Sodomites. Why I say that is because if God were to judge and punish the Sodomites, God doesn't change. He would judge and punish, in this case, the Benjamites. Okay, just because they are his people, God does not practice favoritism. And God does not say that, oh, my people, they can have a double standard. Then that makes God not a holy God. Okay, so the fact that we have a Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed by God's angels, it tells us that when God's people hear the Benjamites practice that same thing, God will judge them for with the same punishment. That is, they deserve to be destroyed. Okay, so we see that God's people, they mix and integrate so well with their ungodly neighbors and environment, they, they fail to maintain their holy identity. And then what they do, what do they do? They become influenced to pick up behaviors and habits, lying, anger, hot temper, smoking, swearing, gossiping. That includes today, yeah? Attitudes like unforgiveness, ungraciousness, and vengefulness, values like vengefulness, that are undesirable to God. Their character becomes like that of the world. So very clearly, right, the people of God can be just as good or just as bad as the people of the world. So with this demand to for the for the old man to bring the Levite out to have sex with him, the owner, the old man of the house went out and said to them, No, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this disgraceful thing. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But to this man, don't do such a disgraceful thing. Okay, so this... Old man offers his own daughter and the Levite's concubine instead of the Levite himself. Now, his sense of hospitality is to protect the man, protect the man who comes under his roof. His attitude reflects the social subordination of women and the fact that homosexual rape was viewed as a particularly severe attack on male honor. Yeah, so both of them, the old man and the Levite, they demonstrate this moral carelessness towards their women. So that means to say that they are very hard-hearted towards their women. They don't care, you know. Between raping him and raping the women, better to rape the women. Lah. Women are not protected or valued. Okay, so 
you see that Christians can have a wrong regard for women or a wrong sense of duty and honor. But what happened is the men of the town did not listen to him. So the men, the old men, sent the concubine out and they raped and abused her throughout the night. So you can see that they're very hard-hearted towards their women. And the Levite just sent her out and let her be raped and abused. So these two men are pretty hard-hearted. Huh? Okay. And probably a lot of the Israelites would be something similar. A lot of Christians would also have a kind of wrong attitude. Now, her master found her in the doorway of the house the next morning. He took her home on the donkey. And then, now he took her do home on the donkey. She was not conscious. Uh, he just put, put her over the back of the donkey. And then when he reached home, he cut up his concubine into 12 parts. So very gruesome, very disgusting, and sent them to all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw said, such a thing has never been seen or done. Not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. So never done before since the time that they came out of Egypt. Think about it, consider it, tell us what to do, what to do. Okay, so what we learn from this part of the story is we actually don't know when or where the concubine died. Did the concubine die, die during the abuse? Or did she die when she was left on the doorway? Or did she die during the time that he took her home? When did she die? Where did she actually die? We don't really know. We are not told. But whatever it is, the Levite expresses no grief or sadness when he finds her dead. Okay, so this is his, not his wife, this is his concubine. She dies, she, she suffers on his behalf to be raped. And when she's dead, he has no grief, no sadness. All he does is just cut her up and send her body parts to the tribes. And the tribes are so shocked, they don't know what to do. Consider it, tell us what to do. They don't know what to do. You see, when God's people do what is right in their own eyes, what is right in their own eyes and not what is right in God's word, nah, there is nothing that is wrong. They can do anything as long as they want to do it. So we see the Benjamite men, just like the Danites, they do what they want. The Benjamite men are no better than the pagan Sodomites of Lot's time. And this hints that they have reached a stage that God would punish and judge and punish, just like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah in Lot's time. Right? Because they're doing exactly what God, uh, what happened with Sodom and God punished Sodom. So, in this case now, the Israelites are so shocked at such a horrific incident that they don't know how to use God's word to decide what they should do about it. There's nothing in God's law to tell them what they should do in this kind of case. Like the Levites, the Christians can be shocked at what terrible things fellow Christians do. They have not paid attention to the things done within their community and fellowship that grieve God. Because to them, worship is personal. Yeah, personal. And whatever they do is between them and God. So everyone can do their own thing lah, because it's personal ma, and it's between them and God. And as a result, when matters worsen, like what's happening here, the Israelite community or the church Christian church, do not know how to handle such problems and situations at the people level. So that's the problem we face, yes, where the, just like the Israelites, huh, they're so shocked, they're so outraged, they just don't know what to do. But we see the people regard the atrocious crime of the Benjamites as something serious that has never happened before. But what they don't acknowledge, but is even worse, is the nation's failure to
to set up a government based on God's moral principles, where God's law is the law of the land. Among all of God's community, and that would be the equivalent of the church community today. Okay, so, so there are certain crimes, there's certain things done that, wow, everybody talks about it as terrible. Yeah, but there are there's the even worse thing that the, the church, or in this case, the, the nation of Israel, they fail to set up something that is based on God's moral principles. And we see that God's laws and discipline have not been enforced. Uh, people do what they want so that violence, homosexuality, crime, and proper worship are ignored or even condoned. Yeah. And the sexual perversion and laws, lawlessness of the Benjamin tribe. This is just one byproduct of Israel's disobedience to their covenant agreement with God. The Israelites, they do nothing to speak up or address issues of backsliding until events snowball out of control. You, if you remember the time when the Ephraimites quarrel with Gideon, yeah, those are examples, you know. The rest, or the, the Ephraimites don't even bother to come out and help Gideon. But then they accuse Gideon of leaving them out. Okay? They don't, they don't speak up or address their own issues of backsliding until snow, until things snowball out of control. Everything becomes too big to control. Uh, such as the rape of the Levite's concubine and not forgetting the intended homosexual rape of the Levite himself. And by this stage, the people are at a loss on what to do because they have not been faithful to obey and follow God's, enforce God's law. Yeah. The deterrent of homosexuality. Let me... The deterrent of homosexuality in God's law was not enforced either. Okay, let's take a look at Leviticus 18, 24 to 30 for the spiritual effects. Okay, let me read. Leviticus 18, verse 24. Do not defile yourself in any of this way, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native born and the aliens living among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Verse 29. Everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their people. Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourself with them. I am the Lord your God. Thank you, Meg. Okay, so God has given the spiritual effects and the spiritual meaning of uh, these uh, sexual activities that are not godly. And that is in the earlier part of Le Leviticus chapter 18, the verses just before this. And so verse 24 to 30 actually explains that doing these sexual acts are defiling. They are defiling to the people and defiling to the land as well. And God says that is why he punished those people that were kicked out. So those people that were kicked out by the Israelites or killed, they, that, that is one of the things they were guilty of, yeah? the, the sexual uh, deviation from God's commands, from God's laws. Uh, and so they were, they were judged for 
their sexual deviation, one of the things that they did, uh, that to God is defiling, that to God is evil and detestable, and that they were punished for. And so this deterrent was not enforced by Israel until it ballooned into an attempted gang rape of the Levite and the actual crime of the rape of his concubine. When we see that the negligence of God's worship and obedience toward his laws lead Israel now to the stage where war against their brothers becomes necessary to purge the land of the evil and the corruption that happened. Okay, that is exactly the reference that uh, Mac just read for us. Okay, so you can see when God forbids something like uh, sexual deviations, uh, there's actually a spiritual law, the spiritual effects behind. Okay, so there is the law of sin and consequences. Yes, law of sin and consequences very often. And sometimes when God says, do not do this or do not do that, we may not be aware of the consequences, but the consequences will kick in. Okay, so we finish for tonight up to this point. We have a little extra time. Is there some point of discussion or insight anybody wants to share? Any question or any points that you would like to refer to? A question, uh, yes. brother. Yes. Uh, the Levites uh, uh, was appointed uh, to 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 be their what the priests, right? When they went into the promised land, uh, the Levite tribe is supposed to take care of the tabernacle. Uh, the uh, priests are part of the Levite tribe, and but the priests come from Aaron's family. Okay, so why was Israel not following that that rule uh, to have the what you call it uh, the priest uh, set out the uh, to lead the, the people spiritually? It, yes, it seems like everybody is doing their own thing. Yeah? yeah, that's exactly what the Bible is telling us because people are not faithful to follow and enforce God's law basically and that is basically the whole point of the book of Judges, uh, where it says that in those days, Israel had no king. And that's exactly what they're doing, John. They are doing anything and everything they want. Okay. Okay. So it, it is similar for us today. You know, we, we may not think that we are similar, but yes, actually we're similar because... Uh, for one, you see, we don't actually have uh, this mentality that we are one people governed by God's laws and we should learn God's word uh, properly and we should teach it to everybody, every Christian and every new generation of new Christian, including young, young children growing up. You see, so what happens is, I give you an example. When somebody becomes a Christian, we just leave the person in the church to join the to join the, the worship service. But is there any follow-up where they are taught the very basic of what does it mean to become a Christian and how should you grow uh, like, like newborn babies, you know, first Peter chapter two, verse two, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. So when people become new Christians, we have to treat them like spiritual babies and teach them to grow step by step. But we don't. We just throw them into the worship service, right? And then they sink and swim, learning anything and everything. What is suitable for a baby 
you know, physical baby I'm talking about is not necessarily uh, followed as a guideline for spiritual babies. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Right? We yes. don't treat yes. new Christians like a baby and, and teach them step by step the spiritual truths and understanding of what it means to be a Christian and how you should grow step by step as a Christian. So this Thank is you. the equivalent, yeah, spiritually, uh, for for the Christian context, and so anybody who becomes a Christian, they just join the service, or some sometimes in some churches they join cell group. But cell group, you see, it is if you think about cell group, uh, you will notice and realize that cell group is not suitable for a new Christian. Do you see? Yes. Yeah, because uh, cell group will just discuss whatever topic you are doing and it's not suitable for a new Christian. We expect the new Christian to just pick up whatever we cover in cell group. And cell group could be for old Christians. Cell group could be for um, so-called middle-aged Christians. And so when, when we have new Christians join the cell group, they are doing it at the level of the middle Christian or the old Christian. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Yes. So they are actually not brought up like newborn babies in Christ. So what we are doing is we are treating them as an adult human being, but we're not seeing the point that they are spiritual babies who need spiritual milk. So the question I have is, in a cell group, do people consider, oh, this is a new Christian coming to join us. Now, our material should be suitable for a spiritual baby. Any cell considers that? I don't think we've come across a cell that says, okay, we've got a new Christian, baby Christian. So our cell group material should target a baby Christian. Now, I think this is probably the first time you hear something like that, right? Cell group should target the teaching material for a baby Christian. We never think of that. We just, okay, join the cell group. And cell group could be old Christians, could be middle-aged Christian, could be young Christian, but everybody does the same thing. Okay, any anybody wants to... Add on to that what, what we have just thought about. Okay, so if not, then what we see happening here is exactly the same. Yeah, well, what I've just talked about with, with uh, John's question is you see that spiritually for us as Christians, there's no baby step by step teaching for the new Christians. And what's happening here is that there's no teaching of the each new generation. There's no teaching of each new generation properly according to God's word. And you can see how in, for example, in Mika's case, the mother, right, and Mika, they are actually doing the wrong thing. Some, some things they know, some things they distort, yeah. So what are the things that they know or what are the things that they distort? Well, you see that the mother knows that the son, the mother didn't know at first that the son stole. And then when the mother discovered, the son confessed. And then the mother blessed the son. And not only that, the mother also uh, didn't discipline him. And in fact, the mother made the carved image and cast idol to put in Mika's house. And that violates Ten Commandments number one and two. Right? Violates Ten Commandments number one and two. And the mother did not discipline uh, Mika. And you know the Proverbs chapter 22 says, bring up your child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. The mother did not do that with Mika. And then Mika actually knew that he's not supposed to have a priest, right, uh, out of his son, 
but he made his son into a priest. He actually knew that was not quite not right or not accurate. And he's from the hill of Ephraim. That means living in Ephraim, that means he's an Ephraimite. He's not a Levite. He's an Ephraimite. He's not a Levite. Yeah, not from the Levite tribe. And he installed his son as a priest. And then later on, when the Levite came, it's the right tribe. It's the right tribe, but still the wrong candidate. And Micah invited him to be his priest. And then that's where he says, now I know the Lord will bless me since this divide has become my priest. So what this means is all these little, little details are showing us how the people know or don't know or they distort God's commands. <laughs> following me? Yes. Uh, then what do you suggest, you know, when new Christians come into the church then? They should be separately taught by somebody else who will go through with them step by step. The first stages of you have become a Christian. What does this mean? What does it mean that you need to do in order to grow? Yeah, so we have to teach them What's the meaning of being a new Christian? So simple little concepts like it means you are born again. Now, what is the idea of born again? There are quite a few important things like you're born again means you have a new life in Christ. And if you have a new life, it has to be separate from your old life as your old self. Right? Okay. So there are, can I use the idea that you are two in one? You know what I mean by two in one? Last, last time we had coffee or tea, huh? two in one, right? Correct. Okay. So now when you are new Christian, you are a two in one. What is the meaning of the two in one? The two in one is first, you are your old self. Second, you are the new baby in Christ. And the new Christian should be taught that your old self and your new baby in Christ, they are not compatible. They don't both have the same values and they don't both have the same ones. Your old self will want to continue to be uh, very selfish and maybe, let's say, if you are hot-tempered, like, you know, the Danites, they're hot-tempered, uh, you have to change. As God's people, you should get rid of rage and anger and you should get rid of all these sorts of uh, wrong emotional behaviors you know so like uh, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry right so verses like that tell us that there are changes in our emotions that we have to work at so for a new christian these are part of the basic package that they should be taught and guided okay so i'm just giving an example uh following Angela's question. So you all understand what I'm trying to say? That is the same situation with the Israelites here. They are doing a hodgepodge mix-up of the right and wrong teachings because they are not teaching it properly to their new generations. They are mixing up everything and eventually... Ah, sorry. Sorry. No, so ideally, a church should have a new ministry to cater for all these people. It should not because be I tell you, no, no church has ever done this before. I think. No lah, they have their own discipleship, but their discipleship or cell group structures, uh, don't not not all. I I think it's not fair to say all churches don't have. Some churches have, but I think by large, many churches don't have. Yeah, where they separate the new Christians just to cover the basic things from ground ground upwards for them. As like First Peter 2, 2 says, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, right? And so this verse, if you look at it in your Bible, it implies that new Christians are newborn babies. And crave pure spiritual milk means they need to be taught God's word at spiritual baby level, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. 
they should be taught God's word at baby stage level, step by step. And they should be able to be taught to recognize like what happens here, the deviations between Mika and the mother, what they are doing that is partly God and what they are doing that is partly their contamination or what we call syncretism. That means mixing up the religion of God and other, other religions. Okay, now I've crossed the time already, so let's close and then any further discussion, we can do it offline. All right, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word actually challenges us to think about what we have, the practices that we do that are right, the practices we do that are wrong, the practices we do that are contaminated, mixed up, syncretized with your your, your commands as well as the practices of mankind. And we pray, Father, Lord, that even as your word shows up this flaw through the book of Judges, that your Holy Spirit will challenge and guide us, Lord, to do the right thing so that we may bring up godly people who are firm and able to recognize when things are done wrong or when your commands have been distorted and mixed up. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to learn together once again. And we ask God that you do not stop teaching us and do not stop helping us to see from your perspective so that we can correct ourselves, we can do the right thing and be able to give a, an apologetic response that upholds your identity and your mission for us as a set-apart people of God. We pray and commit all these things to you in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.